Hey guys, how's it going? So I guess this is part four of this episode. We'll call it an episode. Um, and yeah, we'll probably get one of these every day, at least until I'm through my personal history, and then maybe but bring it down to once a week or something when I start talking about everybody else. Oh, but this time around, we're going to talk about uh, post stupid jerk. There was a couple of stupid jerk things I forgot to tell you. Um, but then after that, um, which involve a few brother or a couple brothers, three brothers technically, uh, that go by the last name of Shilson. And we'll get to them in a bit. So during uh, my time with Stupid Jerk, one of the shows. Or one of the things, we'll do that first. We'll do that first. Um, so we're going around, dropping off our our promo kit, which you know, for you young kids, used to consist of an actual physical CD or cassette. I think they were cassettes at the time, and like some pictures and like a bio, like physically on paper, on paper. I know paper doesn't exist anymore, but. And then you put in an envelope and you go drive, physically drive to bars and drop it off with their people. It's amazing. Anyway, one of the places that we dropped our stuff at and we never got a gig there was there used to be a bar on the West Bank called the 400. Never, I've only been there once and I was to drop our stuff off, never saw a show there. I heard it was you know, another great local dive bar. Um, but when me and Chris uh, went to drop our stuff off, um, they were in a bit of a panic and we kind of, you know, went to the bar and kind of, you know, explained why we were there and, and did our thing. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's great. We got to go because the uh, bathroom is like, so maybe it was a good thing we never played there. And the other thing, which leads right into where I went next. Um, one of the gigs that we did during the summer, which I forgot, which I don't have in my book, but I remembered, was a gig called, that they were calling Lollapalooza. It was the mid-90s. That was a thing. Um, and this is a, I don't remember who all was at the show. I remember Stupid Jerk played Minus One played, and I talked about Minus One before, and there was a metal cover band called Inertia, and they played. And why I remember them is because they did a cover of Testament's Electric Crown, which I had never heard anyone do. Um, I mean, I hadn't heard many cover bands up to that point, especially metal cover bands, but I just thought the fact that they pulled out Testament was pretty freaking cool. And that's one of the things I'd always remember about them. But, so, in Minus One, you had Dave Shilson, which is who I knew as Des at the time. Um, you had, and then, well, you had John Reed as well, and he'll come into the story later. Trust me, he will. And then, in Inertia, Pretty sure, I mean, I know um, Dave's brother, Derek, was on vocals. And I believe his other brother, Dan, was the drummer then, I'm pretty sure. Um, also in this band, on uh, guitar, I don't remember who the bass player was or who the second guitar player was. But on guitar, the guitar, was a guy by the name of Cyrus Baines. And that was Inertia. They played... And this was a gig, it was in somebody's backyard on a lake, I think it was in White Bear somewhere, um, you know, outdoor thing. I remember right before Stupid Jerk went on, it was raining, I think it was raining. But, you know, that, that's the kind of things you do. And the other thing I remember about this gig that I just remember now is at the time, I think both Chris and Des, and there may be one other guy 
with us who all smoked, but were all under 18. And I think the statute of limitations is fine. But, so we'd stop by our liquor store, and I remember going into this liquor store, because I was over 21. Um, going into the liquor store and buying, I believe it was five packs of Marble Reds. And I don't smoke, I've never smoked. So I had to do that for my bandmates. Dedication, right there. So, we get to December, last show at Chautauqua, their high school. Um, and after that, I do not play. I do not pick up a stick. I do not do anything for an entire year, for an entire 12 months, which at the time was very unusual because I'm coming off, you know, junior high and high school and music tech and being a stupid jerk and all this stuff. So I don't play for a year. So, okay, so sometime in, so we're at 95, 96, sometime early 97, late 96, early 97, I get a call from Des, who, you know, we had met, we had crossed circles, he remembered me, um, he called me up saying that inertia was looking for a drummer. And I was like, okay, you know, I haven't done anything in a while, but you know, I, I remember that one performance because it's the only time I'd ever seen them play. And I liked them. Again, they did freaking Testament, which I thought was badass. Um, so I was like, sure, yeah, yeah, not, I, I, yeah. Let me come and, come and hang out and jam and, and do all that. So it was either him or Derek that came and got me and they had gear there, so I didn't have to bring anything, which is nice. And we went to, the audition took place at where they were rehearsing at the time, which was the Dugout, which is a bar restaurant in Matamidai. Not too far from Chris's house where Stupid Jerk used to practice. So I found that a little odd. And what was odder, and, and Derek and, and Dave, you can confirm this, but if I recall correctly, we weren't even set up on the stage in the dugout. We were like set up like in the middle of the restaurant, like amongst the tables and the booths and the chairs and all that, if I remember correctly. Um, but came in and first song I played with them was Wood by Allison Chains. And again, I had not physically played in a year. So I was a little rusty. Not horribly rusty, but a little rusty. Um, and I could tell I was rusty because within about three songs, I was starting to develop blisters, which had never really happened before. I mean, rare occasion, but this was like, so I was like, okay, that's probably not good. Um, but you know, when you don't really get a chance to practice, for an entire year, and then you jump right back into playing, you know, hard rock and metal stuff. What do you do? So, um, needless to say, got the job. Um, and sh shortly after that, I don't know if we practiced at the dugout again. I think because sh shortly after that, we got a rehearsal space in downtown St. Paul. Um, I don't know if it was City Sound or, or what it was, but, and we shared it with another band. It was a relatively big room um, in the basement, I believe, of this place. And this is my first time being in a band that actually had a rehearsal space, which I found really freaking cool. Because um, you could just go there and set up the gear and leave it, and it was awesome. Um, so join that band. Um, by that point, David obviously left minus one. Uh, he was playing bass, Derek on vocals, Cyrus on guitar, and I, we had a, a couple of second guitar players. Uh, one of them was, was this guy named Scotty, who I really liked. Um, he was kind of a, kind of a stoner, a little bit of a flake, but really nice guy, fairly good guitar player. We got along good. I don't remember what happened to him, honestly. Um, 
again, in the year or so I was in that band. Uh, we had this guy named Chris who lived in Hudson. Um, as I think he came in after Scotty, and there might have been somebody else in there too, I don't remember. Um, but anyway, regardless. So, joined that band, started learning stuff. Again, blisters. So, uh, that's when I started with the drum gloves and those up a little bit. What I eventually did, and this is, okay, for all you drummers out there, if you're playing and getting blisters, A, either learn proper technique, um, which I thought I had, but apparently didn't, um, or, don't know where I was going with that, never mind, drummers do what you want. But what I wound up doing, which was a little ridiculous, is that I would get these 100-pack um, boxes of the fabric uh, Band-Aids, the flexi flexible fan fabric Band-Aids, 100-pack, and literally, you know, just wrap my fingers because they had the padding and breathable. So literally it was like all of these fingers almost completely covered, a couple on here. I mean, it was, I had mummy hands. I had mummy hands. And that's why I played, I think, every single show I played with Inertia. And I'm trying to think, because I believe um, during my tenure with the band, we only played two different venues, if I remember correctly. Again, you, you, if, if the Shilsons are watching, you can, you can correct me on this, or, or if Sai is watching. Um, we played, and they were both in Wisconsin. There was this place called the TAC, T-A-C, the TAC, which was this big, um, if you guys remember the Mirage, is similar setup to the Mirage. Um, Walk-in, bar, in, or kind of area in front, bar in the middle, big open space, big stage, lights, the whole deal. Could probably hold a few other people. We never got that many. Um, but, um, so we played there and then we played one, um, kind of private party, which turned out to be not that great. Um, when we played at the TAC, uh, the brothers had a friend, um, Sather, I don't remember his first name, um, but he had a trailer. Did I mention that the TAC was seven miles outside of Avenue, Wisconsin? Basically in the middle of nowhere. Wooden, wood on the inside, metal on the outside. Terrible acoustics, unless you edit field, which again, we never did. Anyway, he had a trailer um, some distance away, um, and that's where we'd stay, that's where we'd crash and stuff. But we played a party at his trailer, brought everything down, set it up, on pallets on his yard the you know however many people were supposed to be there didn't show up we had there was maybe a dozen people there if that and i remember going on and it was really cold it was probably 45 degrees by the time we started everything was covered in dew it was not good anyway so we played the tack we played I think we only played there like maybe three or four times. Um, we could do like a Friday or a Saturday, but then we did a couple of weekends, Friday, Saturday, um, which were nice. But and we may have done two of those, I don't remember. Again, my memory, not what it used to be. But for the Friday, Saturday, for the weekends, we go up. Um, you know, get there, set up, uh, you know, small town. So Friday night, what do you do? Fish fry. That was awesome because small towns do excellent fish fries. Um, and then, so dinner crowd would leave. We'd go on nine-ish, do, I don't know if we were doing three sets or four sets. I don't remember. Um, there were many shots involved, um, kamikazes. 
And I remember, and again, I don't remember oh, if we did more than one weekend. I think we only did, I don't remember. But one of them, I remember, Friday night. So we played, you know, eight to, let's say one, one-ish. Um, uh, we, we videotaped the whole thing. We would get done, hang out for a little bit. We got a bottle of apple pucker off sale, went back to Sather's trailer, began drinking the apple pucker, watched the entire night again, so the entire four hours, then went to sleep. Next morning, that morning, a few hours later, um, I'm sleeping in the living room on the couch, I believe. I awake to gunshots. And so I kind of, it's, you know, 11 o'clock, 11.30 in the morning. And so I kind of, you know, get up and kind of, you know, continue to hear uh, gunshots outside. Wander outside. Our guitar player, Chris, had, to, had gone to bed at a reasonable time, so he was up. He decided, oh, he wanted to go out shooting that morning. And Sather's trailer was in front, uh, or set up on like a valley, like this big like valley went down and there was, may have been like some old cars or whatever down there, you know, top surrounded by tree. I mean, really pretty. But Chris was shooting over the valley and I happened to wake up to that. So that was interesting. So then everybody else, I mean, eventually got up. Um, but it was kind of cool because it was like, you know, living like a rock star for a weekend because, you know, you get up and you go into town and you get, you know, some food and hang around and whatever and go back to the club and write up the set list for that night and play that night. And so it, it was it was fun. Um, and then, so I did that. And then the other thing I remember, and I have a little bit of this uh, audio of this. Um, it's not very good audio, so I don't know um, if I can do anything to enhance it because I'd like to like to share it because it's it's pretty good. We decided at some point after one of these tack gigs that no one showed up at that we should spend like a month learning more crowd accessible, not really dance stuff, but just more accessible stuff that people knew because we were we were going pretty deep. Um, we were doing you know, Iron Maiden, but we weren't doing The Trooper. We were doing The Clairvoyant. Um, Metallica, we were doing... Uh, now the name escapes me. It's one of the unpopular tracks off of Master of Puppets. I will just look it up. But point is, we weren't doing a lot of... We were doing probably about a third singles and hits and then just a lot of stuff that we just wanted to play because we were you know we just thought we could do that let me just look up this Metallica song right away um disposable heroes we were doing Metallica's disposable heroes as opposed to inner sandman or whatever anyway so we decided to spend a month doing more learning more accessible, like five or 10, whatever, more accessible quote unquote songs. Um, but somehow that got changed. There was a, one gentleman who would come to our shows, um, Chris Ash, nice guy. Um, you know, liked us, obviously came to the shows. Um, but somehow it was decided not to learn the accessible, danceable, whatever songs, but to put together for, for Mr. Ash, I believe it was for him, um, or that's what I was told at least, a Pantera medley. We were doing, I believe we were doing Cowboys, Cowboys from Hell. And so we decided to put together this Pantera medley comprised of stuff from the first two albums. So Cowboys and Vulgar Display. Um, and we, we spent... Yeah, I mean, we spent that month that we were supposed to be learning other stuff, learning, putting together this medley for one guy. We played it once 
I believe. And as I said, I have probably half of it on audio. I'll find a way to share that at some point. Because the medley itself is actually pretty, how we put it together was actually really, really good and kind of clever. Um, but the fact that we did this and then again, played it once again for our audience of about 12 people. And then shortly after that, um, what I was told, again, what I was told by probably Derek or Dave, one of the two, is that the band is breaking up because Cyrus had left to join, of all things, a top 40 band. Which, again, apparently in the metal uh, community was a no-no. So that was the excuse I was given. So that, that's how that band ended in probably... Oh, uh, where are we at? You know, sometime in the 97, beginning in 98, sometime in there. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the story of that. Um, it was, yeah, I mean, it was a good band. Uh, I got a lot of experience out of it. Um, the whole playing weekends, that was fun. That was probably the funnest thing. Because again, you get to live like a freaking rock star for two days um, before going back to your normal life. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it was a good band. It was all good. I have no, I have no qualms with any, any of the guys there. I mean, you know, um, which you can't really. I, I've discovered being in, in quite a few bands, you, you cannot hold the grudges. You cannot, you, you just can't do that. It'll get you nowhere, um, and it's always better to have a bigger pool of musicians. Um, don't want to say at your disposal, but you know, in in your in your in your circle, it's always always better to have more. So, unless you know you have someone who like you know slept with your wife or something, or physically assaulted you for whatever reason, outside of that little petty shit don't even worry about it don't even worry about it just you know find a way to get over it you know maintain those connections maintain those relationships always better in the end so yeah that's about it for that chapter um again the shirt i believe that's pronounced sinanu i believe i've never been sure of the pronunciation um, really good band, uh, locally here from the Twin Cities somewhere, I believe. Um, only seen them once, but they kind of kick ass. Um, going to see them again in February at Opinion, if that show goes through, hopefully. Um, and I'm sure I'll talk about them and when I get into the other local bands. So anyway, rambling on now. So yeah, that's it for that, and... I guess I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. See you later.